Welcome, my beautiful people, to another episode of Dino Basics, where we dig up the basics on some of our favorite deceased beasts. My name is Logan, and welcome to Thing Month. You know, it's actually closer. Bit more workshopping, though. Today, we'll be exploring the basics on the sail-headed pterosaur. Thank you to H. Collins9941 for today's topic, the Tupandactylus. The history of Tupandactylus does not actually begin with, well, Tupandactylus, but instead, our story begins with another pterosaur, the Tapehara. The Tapehara was a small pterosaur first discovered in 1989 by Brazilian paleontologists Alexander Kellner and Diogenes de Almeida Campos. This creature was originally discovered in the modern South American country of Brazil, specifically the Santana Formation. The genus Tapehara would first be declared with the type species of Tapehara Wellenhoferi, named to honor German paleontologist Peter Wellenhofer. Over the following decades, two additional species would be declared, including Tapehara Imperator and Tapehara Navigans. However, this would all change in 2006, when Kellner and Campos began reconsidering one species in particular, Imperator. Upon further evaluation, the pair noticed significant anatomical differences between Imperator and the type species Wellenhoferi, leading to the conclusion that Imperator should be classified as its own genus. Exactly how this reclassification should work was not as simple. Kellner and Campos proposed only assigning Imperator to a new genus, to be named to Pandactylus Imperator. Yet another pair of scientists, including English paleontologists David Unwin and David Martill, suggested assigning not just Imperator, but also Navigans to a new genus. For the genus name, the pair suggested Ingridia, to honor the wife of paleontologist Peter Wellenhofer, Ingrid Wellenhofer who had passed away. A truly heartwarming gesture. That unfortunately didn't really matter, because in the classic taxonomy doctrine of Dibs, Kellner and Campos published their paper first, months before Unwin and Martil, meaning they could make the determination, naming this genus Tupandactylus, and include the type and only species Tupandactylus imperator while Ingridia would be relegated to a mere synonym, rarely used in scientific papers. About four years later, in 2011, the species Tupandactylus navigans would also be added, formerly a species of Tapehara, similar to how Unwin and Martel suggested the genus should be arranged. The name Tupandactylus is a bit of an interesting one, the prefix Tupan stems from the South American language of Guarani and is their word for God, or more technically, the manifestation of their God in the form of thunder. The suffix dactylus stems from the Greek word for finger, referencing the construction of the wing for Tupandactylus and many other pterosaurs, having the entire name roughly translate to Tupan finger. Tupandactylus, among most other flying reptiles, was not technically a dinosaur. Instead, they were a member of the Pterosauria, an extremely successful order of animals that first appeared in the late Triassic and would continue to thrive until going extinct alongside the dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous. Pterosaurs were some of the earliest vertebrates to evolve powered flight and included members like the famed Pteranodon and the titanic Quetzalcoatlus. More specifically, Tupandactylus belonged to a family known as the Tapehoridae, a unique group of pterosaurs most distinct for their ornate head crests. 
While many pterosaurs sported some form of head crest, the Tape Horidae took this concept even further, developing some, quite frankly, ridiculous head crests. Dudes rocking the Yondu look like it's nothing. Tape Horidae members are also distinguished for their large naso-antorbital fenestra, the big gap in their skull here, as well as reduced shoulder girdles, meaning the wings protruded more from the tummy than their backs, illustrated here in this little biplane picture. Hmm. <clears throat> Focusing once again on Tupandactylus, both species were fairly medium-sized pterosaurs. Imperator was the larger of the two, able to reach 5 feet or 1.5 meters in height, and sport a wingspan of almost 12 feet or 4 meters while Navigans would grow to about 3 feet or a meter in height and wielded a wingspan of almost 8 feet or 3 meters. Weight estimates vary, but it probably would have weighed around 130 pounds or 59 kilograms. The ornate head crest of Tupandactylus was certainly the most striking feature, with some specimens able to grow to 3 feet or a meter in length. These crests would include a small section towards the front, comprised entirely of bone. Based on impressions left by tissue, these crests would be further extended beyond the bone with keratin material, most likely due to its lighter weight and ability to be flushed with color. While both species sported some form of crests, either species looked significantly different than the other, with Imperator having the larger crest and growing backwards past the skull, while Navigans would be smaller and have a slightly forward-facing direction. This difference between species most likely explained their purpose, as tools for display and communication. Compared to the beaks of modern toucans, these crests would be flashed to attract mates, communicate between individuals, or used as a form of intimidation to appear larger than they actually are. Under this crest was its fairly bulky beak, compared to the narrow tube-like beaks of other pterosaurs. This shape suggests Tupandactylus was more accustomed to land predation rather than fishing, probably eating an omnivorous diet of fruits and nuts, as well as insects and small vertebrates. This head would be supported by its considerably long neck, which has provided new insights into how this animal would have lived. Early studies believe Tupandactylus and many other Tapeharids had very short necks, keeping the head closer to the body and allowing the animal to better support its skull during flight. However, a more recent analysis conducted by paleontologist Victor Bakari disproved this belief, noting how the neck made up nearly half of this creature's spine. This long neck and heavy crest would make extended flight difficult, leading scientists to believe Tupandactylus lived a more terrestrial life, able to fold up its wings and walk quadrupedally across the ground. Bakari compared the lifestyle of Tupandactylus to peacocks, being largely ground-dwelling animals and relying on flight for short travel, to reach the treetops for a better vantage point, or to escape predators. Speaking of flight, the wings of Tupandactylus, like many pterosaurs, are actually extended hands. The skeletal edge of the wings was an extremely extended fourth finger, which would be followed by connecting leathery skin from the end of this finger to the beginning of their arm. These forelimbs were also significantly longer than their hind limbs, further adding validity that Tupandactylus would spend much of their time hunting and walking on the ground. Tupandactylus would have lived during the early Cretaceous, almost 120 million years ago. It would have lived throughout South America, with almost all fossils being located in the modern-day country of Brazil. During this time, South America was a warm and fairly arid environment, flush with vegetation and dotted with inland lakes. 
It is likely Dupandactylus would have lived and hid in the underbrush of these forests, searching for small prey or fruits to feast on. Dupandactylus would have lived alongside its former genus Tapehara, as well as a variety of other pterosaurs like the Santanadactylus. They also would have lived with South American dinosaurs, including gentle sauropods like the Amazonosaurus and previous Dinobasic entry, Amargosaurus, as well as be threatened by carnivorous theropods like the fairly small Aratosaurus and the larger Irritator. The distinct appearance of Dupandactylus has helped this creature score a few appearances in modern media. However, due to it only becoming a distinct genus about 20 years ago, some of these roles instead describe this creature as its former genus, the Tapehara. 1999's documentary, Walking with Dinosaurs, for example, calls these creatures Tapehara, but based on their appearance, was actually a Tupandactylus. The Tapehara of 2015's video game, Ark Survival Evolved, similarly seems to take more inspiration from Tupandactylus than Tapehara. But Ark can get a bit crazier with their designs, so it's really hard to say. Named roles for Tupandactylus include the 2015 video game Primal Carnage Extinction, and as a capturable animal in the 2018 video game Jurassic World Alive. Possibly one of the oddest relations to our modern age is Tupandactylus' connection to the Terodrone Project, an autonomous vehicle meant to mimic the shape and flying structure of Tupandactylus and Tapehara. You know what? I'm all for it. The birds have had it too good for too long. The pterosaurs rise again- 16 years and it still isn't out? Huh. Well, that's just dandy. The Tupandactylus is a truly bizarre animal, with a head fixture few can hope to rival, and a lifestyle contrary to what is expected of many pterosaurs. It is unlikely we will ever see an animal quite as unique and magnificent as this creature. But in the same vein as Disney's Dinosaur the Ride, <laughs> or those Japanese dinosaur performances, with the help of Terradrone, perhaps this creature too, Pan, rise again, and grace this earth with its presence. That's gonna do it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to leave a comment below what you think of Tupandactylus, and if you've heard of this creature before the video. Unfortunately, we are approaching the end of this month, but we'll be ending it with a fan favorite as we explore the basics on the menace of marine reptiles, the Mosasaurus. Thank you for your support, and see you in the next video.